Oh, okay. Um, my name is Garth Holman. Uh, I'm a social studies teacher at Beachwood City School, seventh grade. Um, Beachwood was one of the first one-to-one -one school districts in the state, so I've kind of ran a pa paperless classroom for about 20 years. Um, so I've taught at the university level, uh, University of Akron, for about 15 years in their graduate school of ed teaching technology. So I have a little fluency with technology and how it works. Great. And uh, JC? Hello, everybody. Uh, JC Link here. I, too, work at Beachwood City Schools. I teach sixth grade social studies. So I am very fortunate to be working alongside Garth. Um, I got my master's degree in uh, technology and uh, education from Baldwin Wallace oh, about three years ago. Um, but uh, yeah, I too also run a paperless classroom, I'm always trying to encourage people to try new technologies and uh, I don't know, just have fun with it. So I guess that's part of being a middle school teacher. So always here to help and answer any questions that anybody may have. So thanks for joining us today. Great, thanks. And Rob? Um, Robert Lane, I teach at Springfield Local outside of Akron, Ohio. I teach, right now I teach seventh grade computer technology and I teach robotics to eighth graders through seniors. Um, I've done everything from third grade up through 12th grade with a little stint uh, at the Summit College in, at the University of Akron uh, teaching website management. Um, if that sounds boring, it really was, especially <laughs> because they, they designed it as a lecture class and not a hands-on class, so I bored myself. But anyway, I've been doing technology uh, forever since I've been teaching and, you know, I've reached out to be able to help anybody who needs it as, you know, I, I joked, uh, my one administrator, Mr. Lovell, is on here with us. I joked to him that I've been preparing for this for years. So, you know, just using ed tech in my classroom, this is nothing new to me. So, you know, we're all here to help uh, each other get through this crazy uh crazy time that we're in. Great. Thank you, Annette. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, it's so wonderful to see you all um, and see so many uh, familiar names and faces. Um, again, I'm Annette Krakowski. I am blessed to be with Rick at the Research Center for Educational Technology and, and Thomas McNeil, who you'll meet in a minute. Um, our center focuses on uh, studying uh, uh, innovative tool use, um, both formal and informal learning settings, really from birth through adulthood across the lifespan. I know many of you um, from work that we do in schools, there are at t classroom, GAR grants, and uh, other grants, uh, faculty research grants that are led in some of our school districts. I'm really excited to uh, learn from you all today how you're uh, addressing this challenge and um, also how we can support you in that challenge. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Annette. And Tom? Uh, let me see. And Tom, you may be uh, still muted, so make sure you... There you go. There you go. And that window wouldn't come up, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Tom McNeil. I work in the AT&T classroom. I, uh, I'm a tech coach, a, a tech teacher, a support person. Anything they want me to do down there. I work with Annette and Rick. I'm very blessed to be at Kent State University. I'm happy that I'm there. Uh, and uh, I really enjoy working with the teachers and students come in there. If you come in the room, I'm going to show you something from kindergarten all the way up to college. Awesome. Thank you all. So just again, a quick reminder, I've got series of topics that I'm going to start with. I'm looking at the attendee list and I see, you know, pre-K all the way through college. Uh, and so again, if you have a question or if you have a comment while people are talking, something you want to ask, something you want to share, go ahead and put that in the chat and I'll be uh, keeping an eye on that uh, as we progress through the conversation. So let me start with this to our team. So the coronavirus has obviously pushed a lot of teachers, administrators, tech support folks into the your situation. Um, let's hear a lot of bad news. Let's start with good news. Uh, give us a you know, relatively short success story uh, that you've seen either teachers or administrators or schools where you've seen them shine and maybe mention you know, either software or strategies that you found to be really useful 
as we kind of made this sudden transition from uh, online or face to face to online. Anyone want to start? Sure, I'll share. This is Andreas from Streetsboro. Uh, I love seeing our teachers working with our students, checking in with them online. Uh, a lot of us are using Google Hangout just because it works with our uh, environment. So I know a lot of other schools use uh, Zoom. It doesn't really match with our privacy policy at Streetsboro. So uh, we all have Google Classrooms and a Google Domain anyway. So it makes it super simple for our teachers to connect with our students, uh, to do what they need. And then using Google Classroom. So I would say... I mean, we have a first grade classroom. Missy's on the call here too. That runs uh, basically, you know, one to one environment with first graders all the way up through high school, and shipping out and collecting work from students, uh, having conversations. Um, and so that's like the technical side. And then on the on the flip side, we're also trying to connect with our students just emotionally. So we started yesterday with a project where we're just like reading books and poem, poems to kids, and we're uh, we're spinning up a YouTube channel to hope to, to connect with kids. Um, that may not get that uh, enrichment at home. So I'm super excited to be able to support that and to see what our teachers are doing. It's good to see you, Andres. How are you? <laughs> I guess good. <laughs> um, so this is Garth Holman. Um, first, there's so many places you could start with positive stuff going Garth, on. Garth, you've got to unmute. Oh, yeah. I, I've got all people to, to Garth, mute. Garth is very animated, but no one can hear you. <laughs> it was good, too, but never mind. I can't even see him now. <clears throat> well, there's an issue. In the I'll go ahead and talk. Or, well, yeah, Garth, do that, uh, please. Garth, but um, the biggest thing I've seen out of this, just I mean, on Twitter, on news, just talking to other people, um, I think it's really coming out of how much teachers are actually caring about their students, just caring about their well-being. Um, and a lot of times, you know, we may not be viewed that way or not get that added to our title. Um, but as far as like the school stepping up and make sure every kid that didn't, you know, was on free lunch or something, they know the districts that I've kind of been associated with, everybody's getting their food for them one way or another. Um, and just how like teachers are helping teachers. I keep thinking of like that website, Teachers Pay Teachers. Like now all you see on Twitter and on social media is like how teachers are helping teachers. So, I mean, I think that's really cool. Um, I think we've become an actual closer community um, throughout this process, which um, hopefully we get through it. And at the end, we continue to do that and keep helping each other. JC, keep going with that for a second. What are you seeing, um, you know, particularly whether it's helping students technologically, helping other teachers technologically? What are some, you know, can you give us an example of, of a success story or a best practice that's coming out of your yeah. district? Well, almost like uh, I set up a Padlet the other day of uh, just to have the kids post their pets on there, just for something fun to do, something silly. I mean, these kids, I think they're kind of bored out of their mind with how many emails I've been getting um, from students. I mean, they're, they should be on, like, we ended up changing to a two-week break, but they're still doing work. I mean, they're looking for stuff to do. Um, so, I mean, just the pet padlet, uh, we have teachers setting up flip grids just to communicate with their students, like Andreas was saying, um, you know, that, uh, but, I mean, I've been, like uh, Rob said earlier, you know, I've been preparing for this for a couple of years now, and, I, you know, before we left, I told my students, I said, not much is going to change, it's just you're not going to get to see me every day in person, um, as far as the Google Classroom and all that, so... Um, Briefly, briefly explain Flipgrid and Padlet for people who don't know what those are. Padlet is a uh, like a wall that you have, and people can put pictures, um, titles, and everything. Um, I guess after we're done with the conversation, I can show people if they're interested in it. Um, but you give people the access. If they have the link, they can just post a picture on there. Uh, Flipgrid is a great tool. Um, you can leave very quick video remarks. Uh, I use it a lot in my classroom uh, just to check for understanding. But um, now people are just doing it to really communicate with their students and kind of check in with them. So, um, but those, those are two just very simple off the top of my head that I've seen so far. Um, different to what many people may not know about uh, that could be really useful. And just, just for fun. doesn't even have to be educational, but just to stay connected with our students. Great. Thanks, JC. Garth, are you back with us? Yeah. 
I was recording, and so I couldn't get to the actual button to turn my volume back on, so I apologize. I just said, hi, Andre, so it was good to see you. That's what I was trying to start with. And then <clears throat> I, I think I'm going to piggyback on a lot of what JC just talked about. First, we're on spring break right now, so um, that's a little bit interesting. It's like the quiet before the storm in some ways. Um, I think people are trying to get used to the new reality of the way the world is for a while. Um, but he mentioned Flipgrid, he mentioned Padlet. Um, you know, my wife is a first grade teacher here in Kent, so she did a wiki or a Google Sites so that the kids don't have to have logins, they don't have to find passwords. Um, and we practiced, she's doing story time with the kids. I think Andreas commented this, where she's reading a book to them every day and they can join a Google Meet and see the book and talk about the book. Um, so, you know, I see a lot of people just like JC said, there's a lot on Twitter with people trying to help. There's a lot of tutorials being made. There's a lot of effort to help other people figure out how to do um, this new kind of learning in a sense. What are you seeing, uh, you know, success stories? You know, are there specific tools that are being aimed at, you know, elementary versus middle versus, you know, high school? Are you seeing things cut across all? Uh, I think high school is probably, you know, you get to high school, you have a lot of, and again, I don't, I can't speak for everybody, but, it, you know, anybody else can jump in, but it seems that Google Classroom, and that's going to be a big player at the middle school, high school level. I think with elementary kids, you have a different story. Some of them are going to know passwords and codes, depends on how their schools have set those up. Um, but it would seem that, for me, I think somewhere like a site for an elementary teacher is a better option because there are no passwords, there's no logins for kids to have to keep track of. Um, but I don't know if anybody else wants to comment on that. I think you're going to have, you know, a lot of people are doing meets. We have office hours through our school district where the kids can join um, for an hour and talk to us just like we're doing now every day. Um, so there's all kinds of tools that are out there, whether it be blogging or whether it be like we mentioned Padlet or you know, Google Slides, a way to organize your weekly lesson plans and provide them to kids. Or, I mean, the, the, the number of things, I guess, are unlimited, what we could talk about. Okay, good. Rob, what, uh, what about you? What's a success story or a tool or two that you've seen used successfully as we make this transition? Well, first, I see a lot of teachers who have very little um, experience with technology. They're they're jumping headfirst into the pool and doing whatever is necessary. I've been contacted, you know, each day this week by a number of people on our spring break wanting to know how to do some things. I, I guess I've seen a lot of people taking uh, to Flipgrid, especially the lower grades, because they can re record those videos really quick and easy. And I like the fl Flipgrid idea because you can, you can see those on a lot of devices. You don't have to have a computer. You can record them and send those messages back and forth really easy. Um, we've a lot of I've heard a lot of people using uh, Google Classroom, but we're a Google school, so we already utilize most of the Google suite. It's just I'm finding that people are, you know, getting a crash course in how do I set up my classroom, how do I get material to the kids, and you know what's difficult is if a student doesn't have that. So that's that's where a big concern comes for us. We are not a one-to-one -one school and we are a school district and uh, we have a lot of a lot of kids that don't have technology at their at their home. They don't have the ability to work on this. And if we go past the two week mark, uh, we have spring break this week, but if we go past that the ten days that was originally set as closure I'm not sure what our district's going to do um, as far as reaching out. They're working on that, of course, trying to you know get a plan and stated, but it's it's a hard thing to come up with when you're looking at such a diverse, uh, economically diverse school district like we are. Okay, great, thank you. And so Annette and Tom, you know, when when I think about you all hosting teachers and students in, in the classroom, you know, obviously you spent you know 20 years teaching various tools and. I know that over the course of the last couple of weeks, you heard from some teachers that have talked about some things that, that they've used that have helped them. So can you talk just a little bit about what are some tools that um, uh, that you've heard being used or, or success stories or tools you might recommend for folks? I think, um, you know, just to jump in, it's kind of the same thing um, because 
everyone, uh, so many are Google schools using Google Classroom. That's really sort of a starting point, which I, um, I, I think that is the best way to start rather than trying to learn something completely new. Just at least get your feet wet and get going with something that, you know, either you've got some experience with or your, um, your colleagues do so that they can, you know, you have a place where you can gather some support. I think um, there's two ways to sort of think about it um, you know, in terms of delivering content, but also trying to engage um, students in, in creating content, which I know is, is a bit of a challenge um, out of the gate with, with what we're dealing with. But I, I, I hope that, um, you know, we can really keep focusing on learning and it doesn't become all about compliance. And so I think some of the examples that were already shared are really um, kind of highlighting how teachers are still trying to really keep students engaged with completing assignments. And so I, I love, um, you know, somebody like Stephanie, you know, Garzwai, first grade using a Google site so students can really be engaged in interacting with content rather than things just being transmitted to them. Or even um, how Stephanie has continued um, her daily routine uh, after spring break of uh, morning story time by just reading and recording that and sharing that out. So I think tools like Flipgrid um, are open-ended enough that you can use them to deliver content, but then also engage uh, students in reflecting and replying and, and sharing what they're learning. Um, some other tools that we've highlighted on the website, like EduCreations or Book Creator, are also great tools open-ended so teachers can create content or they can create and share a tutorial or a lesson, but they're also tools that students can create and share what they know, even if it's just like a simple reflection, you know, where they can not only write about something that they've learned or reply to some questions about what they've learned, but they can get creative and insert, you know, an image or a drawing. And again, and you can do that kind of thing with Google Slides as well, but I think it's it's all about trying to keep that, that balance of just not just not transmitting, sharing, you know, not expressing, sharing content, but also the students engaging in creating content, which is obviously a challenge we face even in face, you know, day to day, face to face contexts. Tom, did you have some other things you wanted to add, um, especially with the tutorials Tom's been creating or Adobe or in Adobe Spark? That's kind of a neat tool as well that um, teachers might take a look at, not only for creating content but for student um, sharing what they have learned. Uh, yes, there's a, a few things I would like to share. One of the things, and I'm hoping I'm not taking this from John Bennett, who I think is on this call with us. Uh, John Bennett and uh, Mrs. West over who came to the ATT classroom started doing some things with uh, Screencastify. And they were able to make some lessons and share with their students by using Screencastify. That's one of the the free tools that they can easily get and pick up on that. Also, just like Annette said, using a, a book creator or education, what I like about them, there's something that you can just pick up in minutes. You can really catch on really quick, and everything you need to put it out there is already there on the site. Once you create it, uh, it's on their site on the web, and then if the students log in, they can see all the lessons. Uh, I try to keep it to things that are, as always, free, and that uh, teachers can catch on to very quickly. Tom, just really quickly while we got you, talk just briefly for those people who don't know, talk about Screencastify, because it strikes me that the, that's something that probably could be K-12, K-12 secondary, whatever. So, so talk just briefly, what is uh, screen? Right. If, well, if you have a Chromebook or if you're on a PC, you can get an extension to go in there that lets you capture your screen and make uh, notes or signs or anything right on the screen and then save it all as a video that you can use to uh, share with your students. Or you can take it you can email it to it to them or put it in uh, Google Classroom so all your students can go in there and uh, go over the lesson. So you're you're sort of like recording your page, you're recording an app uh, while you're while you're working with it. Uh, uh, real easy to use, free. You just go to uh, I think it's in uh, the Google Store and then just uh, download it 
and he comes, takes seconds, and you're ready to go. And I think uh, one of our guys here also put some uh, tutorials up on how to use it. Very cool. Thank you. And we'll, we're going to show those at the end. I want to switch gears for a second. Todd and, and Scott and uh, others have uh, been asking about this kind of virtual, you know, these meetings and these connections. And so I want to talk a little bit about that for from a broader perspective. So what has worked well? What has not worked well? I know we had a conversation earlier about, you know, some dangers of potentially, you know, kind of these one-on-one -on -one meetings or one-on-two or one-on-three, one-on-three three, one on three meetings with students. I know Scott asked a question about the, the actual technology side of, you know, setting up meets with students. So what are best practices you all have found in terms of scheduling meetings with students, you know, size of number of students, recording those meetings, you know, safety in those meetings, all those kinds of well, we've already had our office, so this is Garth Holman, we've already kind of started this, but um, we also didn't have a lot of kids join it the first week. So we went out last Tuesday. Um, the kids were not in school Monday. We were out Tuesday. We started office hours, although we were not required to until after spring break. Um, a couple of kids swing in just to talk. We are not recording these. Um, our office hours, we're doing them, like JC said in the chat. We're doing a spreadsheet where everybody signed up. We bookmarked one hangout. So we just bookmarked a hangout. You don't give them a new address every day. You're not changing it because kids will get lost in that. Um, they just click. They're in the hangout with you. You can have your conversation. You can screen share and walk them through. But in general, somebody else asked about the settings. Like in this particular one, um, you had to get permission for me to let you into this chat. So that is a setting on the district then where they can require that. Beachwood currently does not have that. So the kids can go into the chat whenever they want once they bookmark that site. So that is a setting that has to be turned on through the district to keep kids from being able to access that hangout without an adult present. Garth, let me just follow up real quick. So just to, just to guess, I mean, are you setting up like a shared... Google Sheets uh, where students can come in and sign up so you know who's, who's on when? No. We have a shared Google Sheet where all the teachers sign up. So we tried to stagger teachers so that if a kid needed to get to see, like we did every 7th grade teacher. Like I'm 9 to 10. The science teacher is 10 to 11. Gotcha. Everybody's okay. a different thing so that if they need to see me, which by the way, don't start office hours until noon because they don't wake up. <laughs> 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 so... Um, and then, of course, I'm going to be available to meet with kids whenever. If they say I can't do that, well, that's the most important thing we have to keep in mind is our kids are in a very traumatic time right now, and we need to be flexible. And when we meet with them, when they need help, we need to just make it work because the kids could be taking care of their family. They could have parents that are essential employees that aren't there. They're feeding brothers and sisters. We have no real idea what's going on when they walk out of that building. So I think it's imperative that we are taking the responsibility to be flexible to meet the needs of our students. So talk, so, so again, so the spreadsheet, the idea is, you know, I, I know if I want to meet with Mr. Holman, I can go on, you know, whatever, whatever day is listed on a certain time. Uh, talk a little bit about the, is there a concern or was there a concern from the district level about, you know, safety of what's happening in these chats or how have you addressed that? Uh, two quick things. One, I'm online five days a week at the same exact time. So that's our job, is we had to pick an office hour like a college professor would have. You are there every day at that time. So the kid can come five days a week. This is when we're available. Um, the district did not, I raised that question when we first started talking about it, about how are we going to handle if there's only one kid in the room? We can't record because our kids are under 13 without parental permission and all kinds of stuff. In the end, I think the decision is made we just have to, I, I hate to phrase it this way, but take our chance. We're here to do the best thing we can for kids. I, I don't know what the district does to solve that problem. Okay, great, thanks. Rob, JC, and that, Tom, in terms of meeting with students or meeting with other teachers, I mean, the, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, everyone's commenting or calling this the social distance, but I think Garth, to your point, I mean, we don't necessarily want social distance or need social distance right now. We need each other. We need physical distance, right? But how do we maintain that social support, that social emotional support for students, other teachers, and so forth? 
Well, I, I think real quick, just, you know, by me setting up a couple things, the, the pet padlet, the flip grid, just let them know they're not forgotten, really. I mean, we still have a job to do, um, but the kids, they like the contact. They like seeing us. I mean, if I posted stuff I did around the house and put it on YouTube with my kids and that, I'm sure I'd have a lot of students watching it just for the sake of keeping in touch, really. Like you said, it's not... Uh, not to be socially disconnected, but just physically disconnected for a while. Um, so, I don't know. They they, they need, uh, I don't know if love is the right word or not, but they just need to know that we care about them, we're still thinking about them, and doing what we can to stay in touch with them. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, the, some of the some of the teachers I've talked to from Springfield, they've, they've done some similar... We haven't officially set up office hours, but some people are getting on doing some, some meet, Google Meet. Uh, I know uh, some are actually making phone calls. And, you know, I guess what what worries me is I can, I can picture the students who aren't being able to get in and be con- contacted because of lack of resources, of them not getting the just the encouragement that we're providing. I agree with JC that it's not just, we're not just here to instruct. We're here to let them know that we care about them because we do that every day of this, every school day just by interacting with them. And so we're going to continue to interact with them. I just worry about, and, and I'm throwing it out there, what do we do for those that we don't have a phone number for? And maybe we're, I don't think we're the only district that has parents who, you know, their phones get disconnected or they change their phone number and don't share that with the school and they don't have resources to get on online, you know, I worry about those. And so what what kind of ideas do we have for, for students in that situation? And that's a really good question, Rob. Have you had any conversations with the district or have any um, others of you out there have those kinds of conversations? Because I, I, I think you're not alone. Yeah, if anybody wants to chime in, uh, feel free. You can uh, share with us in the chat, or you can feel free to jump in with your audio as well. And Todd just mentioned the IEP minutes, which is obviously a big So yeah. uh, Lauren said, I set up Zoom meetings with my That's awesome. Mrs. Fenimore date, I like that. Uh, that's great. So what about what about the IEP? What are you guys doing or uh, hearing about the voting? special or specific for the IEP? Well, I, Michelle Bassett's here, who is a teacher at Beachwood that I asked to come, who is a special ed teacher. Um, I know that she's having a lot of pressure here on figuring out how to meet the needs of special ed students when she doesn't necessarily see them. Um, just keeping contact, like Rob was saying, I think is going to become very difficult um, you know, I don't want to speak too much of that. Maybe Michelle can leave a comment or put a comment in the search box on her thoughts. Um, but I do know that there are legal ramifications to that. And so they've got a little added pressure that I don't think we're, we're sensing as regular ed teachers. I think the key is to work with uh, the district special ed representative. Uh, I know we've gotten some uh, directives from the state of Ohio and from ODE in terms of what um, is legally applicable under the, the various guidelines for dealing with special ed kids. Um, I feel like we got directive that it's okay to do IEP meetings remotely, for example, and uh, the software that we're using, IEP Anywhere, <clears throat> just added some features where you can then kind of have a live view of the IEP document. So a parent could be connecting remotely with the, the corresponding teacher and then sort of have a live view of the IEP document as they go along and sign remotely. But then I think, to Garth's point, to service the kids is a whole different ball game. A lot of the kids, uh, at least in Streetsboro, were, uh, were, were a little different makeup than, than Beachwood, I would think. Um, you know, a lot of our kids maybe don't have internet at home. They don't have data plans. They don't. Uh, they might not even have a phone at all. Uh, we have a few kids that are in that situation. So we talked about that the other day in terms of our food food delivery situation. You know, how do we reach kids? We do a blast call. We post on Facebook, Twitter. Um, 
all over the place, but how do we get information from people that just don't have any of that? And so that's certainly true in, in the educational aspect as well. Okay, so here's, uh, here's a question for everyone that's in the room, uh, both in terms of adding this to chat. Uh, so if you have a comment or a question, what we're going to ask the panel is what are some kind of shared concerns that you're hearing from teachers or what's the biggest need from teachers? And again, to the people in the room, you can use the text to answer that as well. What are some questions or challenges or concerns that you're dealing with or struggling with that you love you know, insight on or, or answers to. So Rob, you, you talk about engaging with a lot of teachers. What are some of the concerns that you're hearing from teachers? What, what are some of the things you're seeing or hearing? Um, probably the most important is uh, just wanting some direction wanting to know um, out of all these tools what what should they be using um, they, they feel overwhelmed with the variety of options and so they're looking for someone to say you know we really would like the you know let's say intermediate junior high and high school students to be on Google Google classroom or uh, just some type of, of narrowed direction um, the other thing is, is just the access to some student information. Um, you know, I've been contacted by some specials teachers who have 500 kids because they're in an elementary school, and there's no way they don't they don't have all those students' uh, email addresses or even phone numbers readily available. Some of that we can look up, we can figure out, but that's very time consuming. It takes a lot of man hours. So they're looking for, for direction and just an uh, easy way of, of communicating with large masses of students. If you're, if you're in a classroom of 20 kids, it's a lot easier. But I'm, I'm hearing from people who, like junior high and high school teachers that have 150 students or, and, or more, they're, they're really struggling with how do I maintain contact with so many, so many different students. From what I hear, the biggest challenge is, I think, just the pressure people have and the reality that this is, you know, people who teach online courses at the university or at the high school level trained how to teach an online course. They know how to build things to provide, um, to provide an online course to some degree. We gave teachers a day and we said, hey, um, we're going to start teaching kids through the web or sending packets home for the next two weeks. Well, the next two weeks is going to probably turn into the next six weeks. And I think people have to take a step back and breathe some. Um, from what I hear listening to teachers, there's a lot of confusion. They think they can run a normal class, and that's not the way it's, this is going to play out. Um, we've got to breathe a little bit and provide our kids with the best educational opportunities we can. And that's probably going to be as good as it's going to get at this point. I think we have to just keep that in mind as we progress forward. Content should become secondary to kids' emotional, social health with the things that we can do with kids to keep them in a positive atmosphere and moving forward. Engaging activities that will um, provide them with learning, but I'm not sure if we just turn to a traditional classroom delivered through the web, we're going to see a ton of success that way. So I think from what I hear, there's just a lot of stress from the teachers. There's, they're not sure how this plays out. What does this mean? Um, and some of that will come as time passes and, they, and people calm down a little bit about the nature of this. Um, and like Rob said, the direction, I'm not sure there's been a ton of directions from districts because districts aren't sure what to do. They're caught in a bind, too. They don't know how to pull this off. So I guess my ultimate suggestion is breathe and let's do the best we can for something we're not really trained to do. And I think we will see good success there. If, that's, if our goal is to just stay in touch with kids, I think we'll be okay. So, so Scott uh, asked a question, and, and uh, I see Molly joined in as well. 
uh, JC, maybe you can talk about this, and all of you can actually talk about this. What about this live, you know, synchronous versus asynchronous? What are you all seeing? What are you all hearing? What's your best practices, failures, et cetera? Uh, well, so far, I mean, I, I've just done recordings. So the way I set my up, no, we don't have to have anything posted until March 30th. And I did that last week. I made that week of work because some kids, and I have 22 students that have completed it already. Um, so I have not, I've been thinking about trying to do things that are live, but there's no way that I could ever make that like a requirement to have 140 students on at the same time while I'm doing something. Um, so I'm just using recordings now, letting students work at their own pace. Um, you know, I think that's kind of even how my classroom goes where, um, you give them a bunch of tasks and you just kind of, uh, chunk it up the best you can and some students can finish everything in two days like the textbook that I was talking about earlier Rick uh, some students it may take them five days so um, you know it's going to be everything at their own pace and like Gar was saying we just have to do the best we can and just keep, keep chugging along really well my daughter here in Kent uh, she goes to Kent Roosevelt they're running her French class is running a live class so she's showing up for class at, I think it's 1145, and they run a live class through me. Um, last time, I think she said, I think there was about 80% of the kids showed up. Um, so there are people doing the live classes. I think you should probably record those, like I think it was Molly who said that. You, you can have your live class, but record it for the kids who weren't there, can still come back and look at that later. As well as the kids who don't maybe miss something while they were here, because you can't really see everything they're doing, so they might be in the meat, but they're not really in the meat, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so they can come back to it later as well. Yeah, Dave, Dave makes a good point about you know parents and multitasking. I think one of the struggles, and Scott, that's a, it's a good question about the, the live. You know, I'm going back to 20 years of research on K-12 online flood and instruction. And you know what we find at the, at the core of this and I think each of you have touched on this a little bit today, is it's a, it's a pedagogical shift, right? So it's not business as usual in just in a, in a blended or dependent online environment. And so thinking about, you know, just even having kids show up, right? Like if I teach a class and, you know, 25 kids are in my class and they're, they're, they're showing up by literally showing up. But what does it look like to show up in an online environment? Um, am I checking in? Do I have to be there, you know, each week? Or each, uh, each day, do I have to somehow sign a, an attendance sheet? So now all of a sudden we start thinking differently about what does it mean to actually have kids show up? What does it mean to select tools where we can actually find out whether the kids have engaged with the material or not engaged with the material? So for all of you, talk a little bit about this pedagogical shift that has to happen and, and how you're trying to help teachers who may not be ready for this pedagogical shift change their thinking. Before I get into the pedagogy, can I just say one thing about that? I can't remember. I've talked to so many people in the last week. I don't remember who, but they had a digital check-in where the kid did digitally check in. Now, I'm not exactly sure how they did that, so I don't know if it was a conversation I had with anybody here, but I kind of like the digital check-in because you don't know who to contact. I mean, at least if a kid checks in, they took the time to check in. How do you know when you have 120 kids, you know, you need some way to know who's accessing, who's taking a peek at at least what's there versus a kid who never checks in for three weeks. We got a different issue. So I apologize, but I thought I wanted to get that in there. Yeah, so Annette or, or uh, uh, Rob talked a little bit about pedagogy. JC, jump in there. I know you, know you guys have talked a lot about you know the pedagogical shifts. Tom, even some of the work you've done with teachers and, and kind of shifting their pedagogies and just as you're thinking about responding, I, I agree, Lauren. I mean, you know, I, I know you're a teeth to mom, but understanding the, the challenge and, and Dave, to your point too, about the multitasking as well. So uh, what what pedagogical shifts are going to have to happen? Well, I think that we have to remember, and we've talked about this uh, over the last few days when we've joined in together, the, the six of us, but um, I think we have to remember that education isn't a teacher giving specific information to a student who then hears information and then has learned. That's not really how we learn. I think we need to remember that experiences 
and hands-on or different activities. That's how we learn, and we have to let go and be willing to give up our control of that learning. We're, you know, a lot of us have been doing this for a really long time, and we think, well, if they're not in my class, they're not learning, which is totally not true. We have to give that up, let that go, provide as much uh, good opportunity, and then just let the students learn. And if you if you meet them where they are and you give them interest based uh, opportunities, they're going to learn without even knowing it. And one thing I instituted in my classroom is is besides having choice, I introduced a daily little form that was an exit ticket. Just explain to me what did you learn today? What did you do? What did you learn? What do you hope to learn tomorrow? And believe it or not, when they at first they have a hard time filling that out, but then they're like, oh, I learned how to do this little simple thing over here or this thing over there. And they start to realize I learned and I didn't even realize it. And that didn't take anything from me. They learned on their own. They necessarily need something that I was giving them. So we've got to let that go. We've got to change our whole focus and mindset on what school is supposed to look like. Yeah, I, I agree with Rob saying. I mean, I think it's really challenging and all very poor. But I think as educators, you know, it's always been, we've always had this belief about, about learning. And, you know, we've been for years talking about not being teacher-directed. And, you know, and then the whole, you know, we can push on personalized learning. So I think that we're pulled now in, in such a new direction with the challenge that remote has placed on us. So um, the immediate challenge of the technology and trying to make that work is, um, is just really kind of overwhelming. But I think... We just really have to focus on what we believe about deep learning and, and what are the conditions that help that occur. But I also think there's the focus on the social emotional, which teachers have always, you know, from the beginning, that's been part of what calls us to this profession is that that human connection. And so I think um, as educators, partly we're struggling with um, trying to provide meaningful learning experiences remotely but also being very cognizant of um, the, the child as part of a family. And I think that's one of the comments we're seeing um, in the chat. And so um, while you all are under this tremendous challenge to try to deliver instruction, teaching, learning remotely, you're also trying to support the students' families. And so um, I, I hope that um, support you're finding in um, – opportunities like this or even kinds of things I've been seeing on Twitter and Facebook, I hope that they are supporting you because they're taking on a lot if you're trying to support students and their families. Um, and, and maybe that's something we can continue with another conversation is how do we structure what we're doing remotely so that it is doable um, for families. And most of, most of us all have families as well, so we're trying to do this and be mindful of our family and our students' family. But I, I think that we can't forget that um, there's just this human thread in all of this. So um, while we're happy to share tools, um, we're also hoping that this conversation and the future conversations really still focus on all of us as um, you know the, the humans that we are that, um, that want to be connected and connected in meaningful ways and the support that's possible um, when we're all working together. I think Jake Miller was the one that started the hashtag on Twitter, Better Together. And um, I think that's what today is about. And I think that that's um, the only way we're going to survive um, both the remote learning challenge and, and the virus challenge. You know, there's the, the chat thread about checking in. And, you know, I, I attended a presentation at uh, Kent State where one of the faculty who teaches a uh, uh, I don't know, five or seven hundred person class uh, posted and did a presentation on Kapu. And, and immediately, you know, I kind of laughed at first, but then I realized, like, you know, she did some really, really interesting things with Kapu and asked fun questions. Like, I, I think it was Molly, you asked a question of, you know, tools or Sour Patch Kids. And I almost answered your question because <laughs> I didn't realize it was a hypothetical. Um, but, but, I, but I think getting kids engaged and involved is an important thing. The other thing with, you know, K 12 online learning, and I'll go back to to you know, 
people have been doing it for a while. We study parents, and what we found is that you know parents try to get engaged in terms of supporting their students, nurturing their students. There was uh, significantly positive growth. The kids did significantly better. Where if they were actually trying to teach their kids and supplement or replace what the teachers were doing, then obviously the kids did significantly worse. And what, what I worry a, a lot about is you know we're putting a lot on as teachers and administrators, but we're also putting a lot on parents. So what kind of support are, are we as districts uh, or as teachers giving to parents or as educators giving to parents to, to help them? Work through this? So let me let me briefly switch because I know we're, we're nearing the end of our time. So what I'd like to do is uh, I'd like to have Garth and JC. So in addition to these conversations, uh, the teams, our, our team has been working on a couple different tools and sets of resources for you all. And so what I'd like to do is have first JC and, and Garth just go through and show screencasts uh, and talk through the tools that you set up. And then Rob, maybe you or Nat can do the same thing for the PSU one. Uh, these are things that we're, we're trying to help you out. Uh, we need your help in understanding what tutorials you want to see posted. Uh, but uh, this will give you a sense as to kind of what we're trying to do to support you. So Garth and JC, we'll start with you. JC, you want me to to do this or yeah, pull it up. Or you can screen share. I'll chime in when I can. Okay. So we're going to try to do a screen share here. So um, we're running everything off teachersfortomorrow.net. And so something we uh, try to do, it's a, a little short here. Um, we try to do a series of tutorials on basic things for teachers who might be struggling with um, where to even begin. So um, this link, the, the, discussion we're in right now, that's here every day. You can just click and join anytime you would like. The first tutorial you'll see is like an intro to what we're trying to accomplish. But then each one of these buttons, um, you know, pulls down and we've broken down all of these topics. If you're not familiar with, like maybe you've heard Google Classroom mentioned here and you kind of want to get started on Google Classroom. We tried to break everything down into very short tutorials. So if you don't know how to use Meet and you want to have a calendar set up, there's a 316 tutorial on how to do that. Or you want to add, you know, you want to publish your site and view it, whatever it may be. Um, those are all then built on a Google Doc. So as we update, we'll just continue to update and you will see the newest tutorials. Um, the way we started, we did these two are completely finished. We're doing the screen capturing today. Gaming in the remote world, um, we'll probably have done by mid, you know, by the end of this week, as well as the video, which is going to do Edpuzzle, Flipgrid, um, and annotated screenshots for if you're trying to teach imagery. Uh, gaming, we're going to look at game kit, um, the vocabulary, some of the vocabulary things. I mentioned in the chat, a great digital check-in would be Pear Deck. If you know, if you're familiar with Pear Deck, that would be a great way to have digital check-ins because the kids can log in and respond to questions while they're going through their work. So that'll be something that'll be up as well. We also left a form here that any of you can respond to with like specific questions. Um, this is not just us, this is through everybody that's in this chat will have access. So if you send an email and give us a question, we can try to respond if we can't get to you another way. So that form is going to appear on multiple places. JC, anything you want to say about that before I stop and turn it over to Rob? Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, our whole intent here was just to, I mean, really start at the very beginning. Because whenever we first started talking about this, like two weeks ago, um, most of what we were hearing, a lot of teachers had no idea where to even start. So we're like, all right, let's just start from the very beginning. We'll post it, try to make it as easy and as quick as possible for teachers to get online. Um, I actually referred this to one of my friend's uh, wives. She's a second grade teacher um, yesterday and trying to use Google Classroom for the first time. Uh, and she used it and she's all set up and ready to go now. So. Um, they're very basic people that are kind of tech savvy may not uh, get too much out of it, but we just wanted to uh, help people out from, you know, that are just starting and have no idea where, where to begin. Okay, great. And Rob or Annette, do you want to share uh, the other side? Oh, so just so you all know, Rob is uh, brilliant with, with websites. So um, we uh, had reached out to him because um, we were hearing from so many teachers, you know, looking for resources. So um, 
uh, we I'll, I'll hand it off to Rob to share with you the site. Also, um, Rob, if you can talk a little bit about the Padlet and how we can um, kind of all share some, sort of this better together thing. Um, well, to start with, you know, we created this site so that way teachers had a, a place to find all of the resources that we're uh, seeing and coming in contact to, with. It is rcetksu.org. You can, uh, I'm sure Rick will put it in the chat. Um, and basically, we have three main p pages. We have tutorials. And when you click on the tutorials, not only will you see what you've already looked at, the Teachers for Tomorrow, uh, all those tutorials, but you'll also see some other things that we've grabbed from other people, like Tom made a couple of these, and Eric Kurtz, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with him. He has a lot of great tutorials as well. Um, we also have resources, which are just a lot of different resources. So when you click on these, you're just going to find a list of things that you can look through. And the whole idea was that we would we would just give kind of a, a central location for information. The chat is also here as well. So if you forget, uh, just remember this one site because not only can you get to all those tutorials that uh, Garth and JC were talking about, but you can also get to the chat by clicking the chat button. I'm not going to do that and get myself in twice. Um, so basically, we have that. We are working on a Padlet to where we can we can uh, have you share with us what you're doing because there are going to be a lot of ideas that you've come up with, technologies that you've combined or you know found that we maybe haven't used before in our experience. <laughs> And so you, you'll be looking for a, a link to the Padlet as well once we get that up and running. Um, so that way you can share what you're doing and then you're helping not only us share with others, but you're helping each other see what's working. Because, you know, if you notice Garth and JC and I, we're teaching junior high and high school. Uh, we're not teaching elementary. So a lot of you on this call are teaching elementary. And if you can add some of the things you're doing, like Garth said about his wife, who's teaching the, the younger elementary students, uh, that's where we're going to be able to help each other is by sharing of what we've done in our situations. Garth, can you bring up, your, uh, bring up the website, screencast your website one more time and go to the forum just for a second? Sure. Um. So as we're, as we're ending, uh, I want to invite you all to stay involved in two ways. Uh, one is for the remainder of this week, uh, the panel that you've heard from today, we will be here between 1 and 2 p.m. tomorrow and Friday. Uh, tomorrow and Friday will be less structured. Uh, it will be come in and talk with us, uh, you know, share what you're doing, ask questions, uh, get help, uh, give advice. Uh, so I would encourage you to do that. And then moving on beyond tomorrow and Friday, that'll be up to you all. I mean, if this is something that you find value and we'd be happy to do this, uh, continue to do this. On that Teach uh, Teachers for Tomorrow in that Google form, what I'd love to have you do uh, is visit the site, fill out that form, and go back to that form real quick. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. So uh, visit that site, fill out the form, let us know who you are, let us know if you're interested in doing this again. And more importantly, what are the tutorials you want to see us make? Uh, what are you struggling with? And, and when I say struggling with it, you know, you could say, yeah, I'm, I'm struggling with Google Sheets or slides or whatever. That's fine. But it could also be, you know, I'm struggling connecting with my parents or I'm struggling connecting with, you know, getting kids uh, involved and, and interested in math and making stuff up. Uh, I want a tool to help kids do visual representation of ideas. Um, I'm, I'm struggling, you know, understanding the pedagogy of online learning. Those are the kinds of things that, that we want to be able to help you with. So, uh, or if you have an idea, as Rob said, if you have an idea of something you want to share, you want to present to us, we'd love to have you do that and present to others as well. So if you go to the Teachers for Tomorrow site, uh, fill out the form, let us know who you are, let us know if you're interested in continuing these conversations. Let us know what tutorials you want and we'll work on. So, thanks, Garth. Yep. Yeah. And don't forget that that, you know, that... Teachers for Tomorrow website is linked. Uh, it's this second one down. 
on the tutorials. The first one was their introduction video, so it takes you to YouTube. For the second, the second uh, option down that you saw their their website has their page that you just saw from Garth. So easy to get to. Remembering one email address might be nice and easy, and you can get to the chat. You can get to all of their tutorials and the form and everything else. Uh, but you can also get to a variety of other resources. And uh, by by the end of this week, we'll have a Padlet up and going where you can share. All right, great. Any uh, any other comments from anyone, uh, either on the panel or anyone who's joined us today? JC, I see you have uh, you brought your you brought the big intelligence guns in. Yep, nap time is over officially. So, <laughs> good timing. That's how we know. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. We really appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk with you today. Like I said, please fill out the form. Let us know if you'd like to present. Let us know if you'd like different tutorials. Let us know what you want help with. This is our opportunity to shine, be better together, and uh, we're here for you, and we want to be able to help you uh, either as a large group or with your individual schools. So you let us know how we can help. We really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Thank you. I just saw your comment about badges, Garth. That's a good one. Yeah. I was having trouble with this because I didn't start recording until after you mentioned I was supposed to record. So, <laughs> so and then I texted JC and I said, did you start a recording? And he's like, no, I didn't. And I'm like, uh, okay. So then I was running it on and trying to go back for it. I was having a little bit of a tricky part here. I think you started recording pretty early. I mean, I did, uh, but it was right when he mentioned we were recording and I'm like, uh, I forgot to do that. But. Well, you know, it's funny because I had just gotten an email from our two friends in Akron Public saying that they had a district meeting that was running late and um, were we recording. And I said, yes, we are. And I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah, we are. Yeah, so it's all good. So did you all want to put the um, recording up on Facebook? or? Yeah. Um, really quickly, Garth, can you, can you uh, 